to order. Today is Wednesday, August 24th, 2022. We start by acknowledging that the land on which we gather, and that is currently known as the city of West Hollywood, is the occupied, unceded, seized territory of the Gaviolino, Tangva, and the Gaviolino Cretes people. Pledge of Allegiance, um, Commissioner Oliver, would you lead us? Yes, Chair. Uh, if you would stand, put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic in which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, roll call. Uh, Commission Secretary, can we do roll call? Commissioner Oliver? Present. Commissioner Roman? Present. Commissioner Steele? Present. Chair Hallman? Present. Please note that Vice Chair Balbone will be attending later. Also, please notice that Commissioner Berger and Commissioner Soon Xiong are absent. Thank you. Approval of the agenda. Are there any changes to tonight's agenda? I move to approve the agenda. Okay, do we have a second? second. All right, thank you. Um, Commission Secretary, can we get a roll call again, please? Commissioner Oliver? Uh, yes. Commissioner Roman? Commissioner Steele? Chair Hallman? Yes. The items approved. Thank you. Special study session on community listening on pickpocketing. Item five is the special study session and community listening on pickpocketing. The purpose of this meeting is to hear from the entire community, garner feedback on experiences, and share ideas to address this important issue. And we'll be, we will be following the structure outlined on the agenda as it relates to introductions, public comment, followed by commissioner comments. Uh, Director Roman, I will now turn the meeting over to you for introductions. Uh, thank you and uh, good evening, Chair, Vice Chair, and Public Safety Commissioners in attendance. Uh, my name is Danny Rivas and I am the Director of Community Safety for the City of West Hollywood. I'm also present and joining on this discussion is Sergeant Yost from our West Hollywood Sheriff Station. Um, as the chair mentioned, uh, the purpose of this community listening session is to provide an opportunity uh, for the community to share their experiences um, and feedback surrounding this important issue. Um, after I share background on how we got here today and calendar your uh, data, we will move into the public comment uh, phase of the meeting, followed by commissioner comments. Uh, so pickpocketing is considered a part one crime under the Uniform Crime Reporting Program according to the Department of Justice Federal Bureau of Investigation. Um, each month, contributing law enforcement agencies across the nation, such as the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, submit information on the number of part one offenses occurring in their jurisdictions. Due to an increase in pickpocketing that has occurred this calendar year to date, the Public Safety Commission directed staff last month to schedule a study session and community listening meeting, which is why we are all here today. I would like to share my screen now to go over an annual comparison and monthly summary of all pickpocketing that has occurred in the city. So you can just bear with me for a couple of seconds here as I share my screen. Just want to confirm all the commissioners are able to see. Yes, thank you. 
Great. So, uh, so the first uh, chart that you're seeing uh, before you is a depiction of an annual comparison um, looking back at the last uh, six calendar years. Um, and this, uh, the last six, of course, is not including uh, this calendar year, but I will um, get into that data uh, and explain a little bit of those numbers as well. Um, but what you're seeing is in, in 2016, um, there were a total of 179 uh, incidents as it relates to pickpocketing. Um, and then that did increase the following year in 2017. But as we move uh, to 2018 and 2019, uh, 2019 being the highest year um, that we have so far in terms of a full calendar year um, at 337 um, incidents that occurred here in the city. Um, I would just like to, to note for the commission and for members of the public that 2019 uh, calendar year was the full calendar year prior to the pandemic, which occurred essentially in March of 2020. Um, so uh, to looking at uh, the, the data in 2020, um, there was a significant decrease, and that was, again, as a result of the pandemic, given the fact that uh, all of the restaurants, bars, and nightclub and entertainment establishments obviously were closed for uh, the majority, if not the entire portion of that calendar year, again, as a result of, uh, of the pandemic. Um, in 2021, um, we had uh, probably uh, about six uh, to seven months of opening um, and operation of our restaurants and entertainment venues um, as health order restrictions uh, begin to lessen and, and were lifted. Um, and so you're seeing the numbers did increase to 182, um, and that is again comprised of that full calendar year. Um, looking at this calendar year um, for seven months total, we currently are at uh, 450. Um, incidents that uh, have occurred in the city. So we're seven months into this calendar year. And of course, you can see in comparison to the previous six years, uh, we're on track to obviously having uh, the highest year uh, in terms of pickpocketing in the city. Um, I'm gonna be just uh, moving on down to uh, monthly comparison in terms of uh, pickpocketing in the city. And so this is the second chart that I wanna just briefly go over. Um, and so for uh, this chart, this is a month to month of just this calendar year of 2022. Um, and you're seeing that um, there was uh, certainly an, an uptick um, in June with uh, 126 uh, incidents that did occur. Um, uh, however, for uh, that same month, um, there was the highest number of, of arrests. There was a total of eight arrests that occurred that month as well um, by our West Hollywood Sheriff Station. And Sergeant Yost, uh, who I mentioned is present here, can speak to um, that arrest and, and any information or questions uh, related to that. Um, after that uh, arrest was made, uh, or those arrests were made, excuse me, um, you're seeing the significant decrease between June uh, and July. So for the entire month of July, we had 30 incidents. Um, and then the last column that you're seeing there um, is for the month of uh, August. And uh, that is as of uh, today, uh, which it seems that we are definitely on track and happy to report that um, it looks like we're gonna have the lowest month uh, for the entire calendar year. Um, and again, uh, Sergeant Yost is available to answer any questions as it relates to that. Um, so uh, additionally, as I uh, had mentioned, uh, Sergeant Yost here from the West Hollywood Sheriff Station actually supervises our entertainment uh, policing team um, as well as our cops team um, and can uh, definitely speak to any plain clothes uh, operations that have been ongoing as a result of, uh, of the community concern, of course, uh, directly related to the increase that we're seeing here uh, related to pickpocketing. Um, so that uh, concludes uh, staff's uh, presentation. Um, and at this point, I will turn it over to uh, Sergeant Yost if there's anything else that he would like to add um, associated with this. And if not, then we can directly uh, move into the public comment portion uh, of, the, of the meeting. Good evening, Commissioner, Chair, Vice Chair. Uh, just to reiterate, those numbers. Um, I just want to bring up that West Hollywood Sheriff Station deputies have really been working hard these past couple months um, regarding these issues and all crimes within the city. 
Uh, for this month in July, we had 237 arrests. So these guys are really, I mean, this is the, most, the highest number of the calendar year as well. Uh, last month was 184. So there, or I'm sorry, in June. So in July, 237. We don't have the numbers yet for August, obviously, but our teams are really trying their best and working as hard as they can to knock down and combat these issues. Um, that's it for now. So, uh, Chair um, and Public Safety Commissioner, so uh, we will now move into the public comment uh, portion um, of, of the meeting. Um, we currently do not have anybody that has called in um, via Zoom. Um, so I will be turning it over to our Commission Secretary to uh, do any in-person comments. Great, thank you, Director Rivas. All right, so the first speaker we have is Robert S. If you can please approach the podium, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, everyone. Sergeant Rios, how are you? Hi, everyone. My name is Robert. I'm with uh, the Abbey Food and Bar. I am uh, the director of security there. Um, this is something that's been plaguing us for quite some time now, not just this year or last year, but for many years. And uh, we spotted it a long, long time ago when they first started hitting us. What we did, this might help out any other venues out there as well. We try to identify what's going on, who's doing it. If we don't know who's doing it, we're, we're chasing ghosts. So what we did, first of all, is try to identify who it is, who are they working with, how many other. Next step is how do they operate? And unfortunately, they're, they're pretty good. They work in a, in a well-organized team. There are multiple pickpockers. When you see one, they hand it off to another one. Then they have a holder. It's, it's, it's a whole network of them. It's not just one. Um, once you identify them, we try to make contact with them if possible. What we did is decided to do a database system with Cluster. I'm not sure if anyone can see this, but this is an online private photo, shop, uh, photo app, uh, app sharing that's online. Anyone we identify a res detained that's involved in pickpocketing, we, we put them on here and we let all our staff see it to prevent them from coming in. Because unfortunately, the way things are going, we arrest one, five more pop up. Uh, this way, we can't arrest them we can prevent them from coming in. And at the end of the day, if I can prevent them from coming into our venue or stealing phones, then we did our job. We don't have to arrest them, we can prevent them. And that's the important part, trying to stop this from keeping it, keep it going. And it's not just here, by the way, it's everywhere. This is a, a epidemic. It's in San Francisco, it's in Miami, uh, it's in New York. If you, if you do a little bit of research online, it's everywhere. It's in festivals, um, it, it's, it's horrible. But unfortunately, that's where we are right now. And we try to prevent it. In the last two years, we've made 45 arrests, just us. We've made 45 arrests. Uh, and uh, of those arrests, a few of them have tried to come back. So they come back with fake IDs, they come back with different types of identity. I've had fake passports come in with the same person with date of birth. Luckily for us, we've stopped them. But we've only been able to stop them coming to our venue because of this. And if we didn't have this, it would be pushing like water. We wouldn't be able to stop anything, you know? Um, Try to deny entry if you can. If you can't arrest them, try to deny entry and create a database system for anyone who's interested. Try to tell your employees what to do and how to share the information to prevent it. Because other, other than that, it's, it's almost impossible to stop them. If you guys have any questions? I'm sorry? The number of internal arrests, is that 45? 45 in the last two years. And can you share that chart with us? I would like to pass it what you just held up so we can get a closer view of it. Sure. Uh, if you can just bring it up and we'll make sure you get it back. And is this shared with other venues as well? We do. But unfortunately, they haven't shared a whole lot of interest and that's internal. So all our security guards, all our employees can look at that and say, hey, wait a minute. I think you're a thief. We can't let you in. But that's worked great. Yes. Um, so when you make these arrests, what happens? Do you hold them and then the police come over and, and take them? We call law enforcement and law enforcement takes over. Uh-huh. Okay. Yes. So that's 45 transfer arrests that you detain someone internally, they were then handed over to the U.S. Department of Sheriff and made physical, oh, thank you. Correct. Made physical arrests. Okay. Correct. Um, thank you. And... I guess the other question that I had was, have you seen an, uh, a, a shift in activity 
from June to July to August, what's the landscape right now? Because I know the signs are still present. What's the, what's the landscape of pickpocketing and cell phone theft right now at the Abbey? The my feeling, the past couple months, we haven't seen that much of an increase. It was in the beginning of the summer, I feel, higher than it is now. Yeah, Correct. it peaked. Um, but the problem hasn't gone away. It's still an active situation that we're working against. Oh, I'm sure. Not with us, but in the city, yes. Okay, so it's no longer a problem at the Abbey, or it's just something that you have a better management system, uh, system in place for? Well, what we sense is a problem. You have to define it. In other words, if someone comes up and says, I lost a phone, I have to decipher, did you lose your phone, or did someone steal your phone? Mm -hmm. So there's a difference. If we feel it's a, it's a theft, if five, five people come up and say, hey, I lost my phone, or someone stole my phone, there's a thief in there. Yeah. But if someone just randomly comes up, uh, one at the end of the day, lost my phone, well, then you probably just lost your phone. Yeah. But I haven't felt it's been an issue in the past couple months versus the beginning of the summer than now. But this has helped tremendously. Would you be willing to share that uh, or participate in a citywide program to share those kinds of photos uh, sure. and the identities of, of suspects? Absolutely. I mean, this helps everyone. I, I understand why no one that's really care, to be honest with you. Yeah, and I um, have a question. Sure. Are there any particular nights of the week that um, are higher incident evenings? Like, is it Thursday through Sunday? I know there are more people out. Weekends after 11.30. Weekends, we actually even timed it. We know exactly when they come in, when it gets busy. Thieves don't waste their time coming in early. They want to come in when it's packed. And we've actually seen them walk in at 11.30 and that my guys have to go and chase them. We've shadowed them. So we know exactly when they come in, what time to come in, and how they work. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Robert. Thank our, you. our next speaker is Tard Barnes. You'll have three minutes to speak. And I was just gonna follow up with Rob, I think. Um, a lot of times, as great as my security team is uh, in catching the thieves, uh, my name is Todd Bonds, I'm the general manager at the Abbey. Um, as soon as my security guys are catching them, they are throwing the, the phones on the floor. And once they've done that, they're no longer arrestable. You can't even arrest them. So unfortunately, there's, there's a whole thing there legally. It's, it's very difficult to do, but um, I have a great team and Rob, Rob is great. Um, Pickpockets have been targeting West Hollywood bars and nightclubs for a long time. Uh, people bl like to blame the nightlife venues for the problem, but we are just as frustrated as everyone else. Our security team and the West Hollywood sheriffs do a lot to help keep people safe from pickpockets, but people need to do their part too. We've had signs up at the Abbey warning people about pickpockets for years. Every night we see people leave drinks, cell phones, valuables on the tables, and walk away. Cell phones are often in unzipped purses, back pockets, which is making them easy to grab. In addition to the signs warning people, uh, our management, security, and service staff are all trained to remind people to take their drinks and valuables with them. Security reminds people to put their valuables in their front pockets and to remain aware of their surroundings. We have multiple undercover security guards on patrol and an ex and extensive network of cameras uh, which have successfully stopped many pickpockets. Uh, like many times, Rob might recognize someone, he goes to the cameras, he'll follow them around the venue and, and can actually stop them before they've actually even uh, attempted anyone. Uh, we immediately turn over the pickpockets and thieves to the police. We work with the law enforcement regularly and have done sting operations before. Uh, we've been told by law enforcement that we do more to prevent these thefts and are more cooperative than most other venues in West Hollywood. Uh, over the past two years, as Rob said, we've caught and had arrested 45 people trying to pickpocket our guests. Uh, the thieves aren't going to stop. Uh, the nightlife venues and the sheriffs are doing their parts, uh, but guests need to do their parts too. Um, and then also, just uh, uh, to bring something else up, I know it doesn't have anything to do with pickpockets, but my boss wanted to bring it to everyone's attention, and I know you know my boss, Mr. Cooley. Um, since the park has opened, um, the problem with uh, the vagrants, the homeless people, is skyrocketed. We've had vagrants throwing bottles of uh, Stolichnaya into, into the abbey, exploding. The, the things that are going on, there's just, they're defecating in the, in the, right next to us, but pickpockets, yes, is one thing, but I just wanted to make sure that we're not 
only doing this. We also focus on, on the homeless uh, problem. This morning coming to work, I know the police had to show up because uh, there was one that was taking the tables and throwing them around uh, and screaming and yelling and taking a, uh, his friend's guitar and busting that on the ground. The code compliance uh, ambassadors couldn't do anything. The sheriffs came, couldn't do much either, but um, there is a problem there, so I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I do have a question. Um, Typically, IDs are checked when guests arrive, correct? Right. Um, does your security personnel at that time um, reiterate to guests to please keep your personal belongings, especially your cell phone, yeah. close so, to you? Yes, we, we, we do that. I do it myself. Security does as they come in when they're checking purses is keep your purse closed. Um, staff re recommend when they're at the tables and they see people leaving their table, their phones on the tables, they will tell them to, you know, keep an eye on it. Um, it's something that everyone just needs to really be aware of. Um, it's, it's definitely a problem. I also wanted to bring up, um, I know that uh, Mickey's has a system. I, I don't know how, how it works very well, but, and I'm not sure if they're here tonight, um, but they have... Uh, a system where they come to the door and the ID gets scanned um, and it, it brings something up. It, it looked like it was something that um, they thought could be interesting for the city of West Hollywood and other venues to use. Um, I do think it's a good idea to have the venues more together in, in kind of a, okay, we just cut these guys here. If there was some way to warn other venues, these guys, boom, they've done this. You need to keep an eye out, and the warning goes out to every other venue. I think that would be a great thing for uh, us to be able to do that, give that to other people. But I know, um, like I said, Mickey's has, it either reads the, the IDs or scans the face. It takes a picture of them, actually. Um, so they have that in their, da their database. I'm not sure if they're using that on a Friday, Saturday night when it's really busy, but I have seen them use that at other times. Is that something that, that the Abbey would be willing to implement? Um, we're willing to do whatever we need to. It would also have to be something that is logical, that works for us because of the volume that we do. Um, I know that, like I said, Mickey's doesn't use that system every night of the week because it does take time to take a picture of each person and scan their, their, their ID. So if it's something that's easy for us to do, I know that Rob, at one time, uh, this system was working kind of good for us. Uh, it was a little scanner, a handheld scanner, that um, recorded the ID. It didn't, it didn't flag anything, but it recorded everyone's ID who came in. So as they came in, if there was someone that they saw on the, uh, suspected, if I'm not mistaken, Rob uh, would see that there was someone that they recognized that was a thief. He went back through every uh, ID that he scanned and was able to pull up that person that had just come in and was able to give that uh, ID to the to the sheriffs at the time, so and we we are definitely actively trying to do as much as we can uh, on our part to to mitigate the the thefts. Do the directors of security between the different establishments uh, stay in contact with one another? I think Rob, yeah, Rob can get up and tell you more about that because I know he does talk to them regularly. So, do you answer that quickly? There's only one that I've actually had a good relationship with and we communicated for months. And what that was at uh, Rocco's. And unfortunately, other venues weren't, didn't care. I've, I actually personally went out and handed out pamphlets, this information, how to communicate together to stop this. And unfortunately, they blew me off. Um, so at that point, I said, look, if you don't want to help prevent this, then there's nothing I can do. Uh, luckily for us, Rockles, the, the, one of the guards there was, was able to work with us, and we would text, text pictures of each other, like, hey, watch out for this person. We just arrested him. He was detained last week, and it worked fine for months. But unfortunately, I think that was the only venue that cared to, to help us out or help anything. I mean, it would be great if we could get a system like that implemented between the bars and the security personnel where there's a relay system. Right. We just got hit. They're on the streets. So all of the bars and restaurants are notified. Yeah. Would you, yeah. do you think that a city-wide policy, something that um, council might implement would be helpful? Once again, I, I think it, it's gonna have to depend on how everyone runs their business. Um, I don't know what that would be. Is that, is that kind of like a, a little iPad that gives warnings of, Connected to everyone else, and just the recording, uh, the the scanner that verifies an ID and then records. That that isn't necessarily very easy to work. We did it for 
for a while, but then it, it was just, when we got really busy, it really was more overwhelming and not really that. And, oh, when it would you know, broke, break down. Broken. Yeah. So there's always those kind of things that you're going to have to deal with. But I, for me, it would just be like, okay, is there an emergency broadcast system that we could broadcast to the other clubs? Hey, look out, this guy's coming. He just started a fight here. He's coming down Santa Monica, heading towards Mickey's. And I'm like, book, there you go. It's, it's, I know in the past we have had, because, you know, like with Rocco's and with other clubs, I will have like a GM say, hey, look, this, this, this couple here came here. Um, they're heading your way. And then we keep an eye out for them too. So um, a little more communication, I think, between the clubs would be definitely a, a good benefit for us. All right. Um, any other commissioner questions? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, do you feel that a dedicated sheriff, if there was a deputy there that was just for that purpose to communicate between the business, I'm just, first of all, I want to be clear that I'm a little concerned about the civil liberties issue with just sharing IDs and sending that information across. Um, I think there's a lot of questions to be asked on that, but um, in terms of having something to help support you all, get information from one venue to the next, if, it, if you've got other security teams that don't want to work with you, to the point of how else can we support that? Is that something that if there was someone dedicated, somebody, whatever it is, say it's, you know, I don't know if it's block by block or deputy, whatever it is, is that is there a way that that could support in that effort? I'm not sure if that's really the way to go as much as if, if there's some way that we can use technology. It's like everybody's mm -hmm. got a cell phone. Is, is there an app that everybody can sign up for yeah. and say, hey, this is the app for West Hollywood that's created to help us. Boom, here you go. They go boom, and everybody gets an alert on their phone. Boom, here it comes. Something like that might be more helpful than, than anything else. Just to alert people. Yeah, and we do have a city app, so there might be some back end stuff we can look at. Right. Um, can you talk to me about the process at the Abbey for someone comes up, my phone's stolen, what's that process? So when that happens, we send them to the bakery because when anything does get turned in, it gets turned in directly to the bakery. Um, it's a big venue, so everyone knows, security knows, management knows, staff knows, whatever happens, goes, anything gets turned in, goes right to the bakery. So when someone does say they had something stolen, we tell them to go check at the bakery. Um, if it's not there, we tell them, you know, you can check back again or call in the morning. Um, every night we have our security guards that uh, make a list of everything that was found in the club that night. Um, and that's posted, the bakery person then who comes in the morning has a list of every ID, every credit card, every phone, every purse, whatever that was left that night, they can go down the list. So if somebody calls, yes, I have it here, come on in and get it. And then what's the process in terms of engaging with the sheriff? So these internal arrests, the 45 that then become actual physical arrests with the sheriff, what's, can you just walk us through that process? So I think Rob would probably be a little better at that okay. because he deals with that all the time. So if you want to come up here and just walk him through when you call the sheriffs and, and uh, have the people arrested. Yeah, once we're positive that we, we might think we have a thief, we can just call law enforcement, let them know what's going on. They get there pretty quick. Uh, we go through the surveillance footage and hand them over to them and we take over. And what's the in, um, policy um, at the Abbey, and I'll be asking everyone, but what's the policy in terms of surveillance footage? We had a sexual assault and safety meeting just a few nights ago, and we're having this meeting. They're all, it's all um, important, including the issue with the unhomed folks that are um, creating a stir there. So all of these things have to be talked about. But one of the things that came up was footage, right? And so in this scenario as well, um, we've definitely had community reports of people saying, hey, I know the person, can I see the footage? What is that, what's the, what's the policy and how are we supporting in that way? So when it, when it comes to reviewing footage, um, we don't let customers come in and take a look at that footage. Um, we get as much information as we can from that customer to then go and look at the footage ourselves. Um, we do tell them that we turn in any and all footage to uh, the sheriffs and the police departments uh, that might be doing an investigation. Um, so if they do feel that there was a crime that was committed, we tell them definitely to go and file a police report and that we always cooperate with the police. Um, anytime that the sheriffs or police have come in, I've sat down with them and gone over the footage with them and uh, tried to locate whatever uh, crime may have been committed at the, at the Abbey for them. Okay. And we've been successful that way, too. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Rome, do you have any questions? You're good? Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions from the commission? All right. Thank you You're very welcome. much. Thank we you. greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Todd. Um, before we continue with our public speaking, I just want to um, 
let the commission know that um, Vice Chair Balbone has joined us. Next to speak, we have Danny Hank. My, my apologies. Uh, good evening, uh, Chair, Vice Chair, um, and esteemed commissioners. Uh, my name is Danny Hang, a resident of West Hollywood. Um, I just wanted to thank Commissioner Steele for bringing the attention to this special study session for pickpocketing. Um, I myself have been a victim of pickpocketing multiple times. I'm not going to say the name of the establishment, but um, the chart and breakdown that you guys showed was fine and dandy. Can we possibly, as citizens, get a breakdown of how many cell phones were stolen from which establishments, what's been reported, so that way we know. Uh, Mickey's knows that there was an issue. They were very proactive in implementing their own system. And if we see on you know, any kind of stats that, whoa, their system works, they don't have that much pickpocketing recorded from that location. Um, I wanna commend Mickey's for taking their own initiative to implement it. Um, I also believe that Fiesta Cantina has some sort of a system as well. Um, so if we're able to know how many phones are being pickpocketed from what you know, uh, entities, then that might give us a better idea of what's working and what's not working. Um, I appreciate that 45 people were arrested at a certain establishment for pickpocketing, um, but if an issue has been known to happen for quite some time and they're you know, not doing anything about it, or you know, like I, the graph that the gentleman showed was great. It has all the photos of potential pickpocketers. But is that turned over to the deputies, to the sheriffs once a week? Is that turned over once a month? If you're not sharing that information with the sheriffs, how can they put it on their radar to catch such perps? Um, while I appreciate the communities uh, trying to rally to get together to help combat this issue, yes, it is gonna be around. Yes, it, it, it happens at festivals, um, but it's happening here. And I just wanna commend um, businesses like Mickey's for trying to at least do something about it to help their customers. Because um, if they're scanning IDs and taking photos and something pops up, then they know that you know, they won't let that person in um, to potentially steal a cell phone. Um, thank you. Um, Dan, is, is it a question for Danny or for... Okay. Five, there was 45 arrests made from the Abbey. I track the arrest reports each week, and I don't recall arrests being reported at the Abbey. There was the big one that happened a couple months ago, but I watched those religiously, and I didn't see that there was 45 arrests made over the course of the past year from the Abbey first. So I'd love to see those arrest reports if we could take a look at them, because I, I don't know how they're being reported. Maybe they're being reported under something else, so it makes sense for us to see that. And then also, what happened to those people that were arrested? Were they charged with grand theft? Were they, were they allowed out without bail? Like, we just need to track that to make sure that our DA is doing their job and prosecuting these people so they stop coming back. I heard tonight that uh, they, were, they see the same people coming back. Uh, that should not be happening. So I'd love to know what's happening there. And if there is a representative from Mickey's, we would love to hear from you as to what's going on and if you guys have been successful, because I've heard about that program working in New York City where they scan IDs in. And so if you scan somebody's ID in, and they pickpocket somebody, you can go back through the system and identify them through that ID, and then hopefully make an arrest that way if they get away. Yeah, we Thank do you. have, um, Adam is on our schedule to speak Perfect. from Mickey's. Um, I think we can move on. Okay, so we have Larry Block next to speak. Hey, everybody. Um, it's interesting, as I was um, walking across the street between Larrabee and Santa Monica Boulevard this morning, um, a resident is showing a couple of guests around the city, and he says, at nighttime, this is a totally different scene. And that's what really happens at night during the day. And this pickpocketing problem is 
been going on for so long, and after the people pickpocket at the bars next to me all over town, where do you think they wind up? They wind up with the tap cards at block party in the middle of the night, uh, tapping the card, and, and every Friday, Saturday, every Sunday, and every Monday, the, did I leave my, lose my card, did I leave my phone, did I leave my wallet, and uh, th this, I don't even know if there should be a central system for lost and found for the entire city for downtown. After three days, it goes to another, a, a, a joint place because we don't know what to do with the stuff when we, when we get it half the time, and we find phones in underwear bins, and, you know, there's this, where do they go? And I've spoken to uh, Captain Mulder about this, and there's plenty of, there's, there's easy solutions. Send a cop down to my store between 12 and 2, and I guarantee you those pickpockets are coming in at least once a night. Um, then it becomes the cost of a, a business owner to chase this and get footage. It is completely not worth our time when they call on Monday morning and ask us for footage. Uh, it, it, you got to get the AV guy to come in for $25 or $50 an hour, and already the loss becomes a real tangible other loss. It doesn't, it doesn't pay when even on shoplifters, less than $1,000, they don't do anything. So I'm proud to dress all of the homeless people in this town in poppy jacks, drop straps, and addicted drop straps. You can see my stuff all over. They steal it right off the rack, and when my guys yell, we're going to chase them. That's just the cost of doing business. Let them have some of the junk. Maybe they can have some new clothes too. But the idea of getting our arms around this problem um, is, you know, been going on for a long, long time. And uh, even uh, when we talk about the decrease in the statistics, that's very encouraging. But the truth is that after July, there's been like a fall off between total traffic to the city. I don't know if anybody else would tell you that they had the worst year-over-year -year declines that they had since COVID, but I could tell you that we did. Um, and since the news comes in, public safety becomes an issue, and it becomes right to the forefront, it was not worth those two deputies to have $500,000 in bad press and a, a really bad business climate in this town because of some of the news, because of some of the defunding. There are, you know, press that took over the city. It wasn't Weehoville, and I'm not here as Weehoville, I'm here as a resident and a small business owner who's worried about my employees every single night, where we've had to change our store hours, we've closed earlier, we close at midnight now. I have to have a second person on the shift to watch out for security, and that cost of that additional hour, $50 an hour, you can't clock at $100 an hour and break even, you wind up closing. And I think my store is sort of a special little place where people go who aren't just in a bar drinking, and um, there could be, it's important to have safety on the streets, so we have nothing. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry, I a, can, I, can I engage with Larry just a bit for a few? Thank you. Um, I agree with that because I see quite a few people going into block party that are drinking water, that are drinking coffee. I think it's also a place for folks to go in community that aren't going bar hopping, um, but that still want to engage in the nightlife. So I, I appreciate that. Um, Question for you about the found phones. What do you usually do and kind of what direction have you been given, if any, on the, just on the found phone, when you find that stuff it, on a Monday? It's, it's, it's so prevalent over, like, every Friday, every Saturday, every Sunday, we get calls in the morning, people looking for something, because when they don't know if they were pickpocketed or they don't know where they are lost, they wind up recounting their steps. So they call each of the businesses. So I'm sure each of the businesses are dealing with the same call from the same person who's retracking their steps. So for, for us, either we have it or we don't. Really, we really always don't. We really never have it. The odds are those pickpockets is like, you know, uh, empty hanger. They came and they also took an item of clothing too. It becomes, you know, untenable to stay open late at night. And, uh, and, you know, deal with the rush of the crowds. It's like in the day, it, you know, but that's the peak hour of business. It's 12 to 2 a.m. Yeah, yeah, I thought you had mentioned finding phones in uh, underwear bins. That's why I wanted yeah, to Friday, just... Yeah, Friday, Saturday night. Friday's as busy as, busy as Saturday night. The, you know, Friday night is actually, te the tempo's always usually very strong. People from the weekends and Saturday night. Sunday is a little bit slow. Yeah, and do, thank you. And then do you get any of the phone, the phones that have been stolen coming in there? Is there any activity with that that you see? Have you seen? Well, they use, I, not maybe as much phone as when they have the pickpocket wallets or, you know, the tap cards. Yeah. You know, um, we've had thousands of dollars worth of loss, you know, due to that issue. Okay, and then what's the process for that? Like, what's, what are the steps, what happens? So that they come in, they've got a card, is it just 
You discover I, after the fact, I, or? You know, our policy is maybe similar to the Abbey's. If a, a customer wants to review the footage, they, they must have a police report. We don't stop and stop the wheels in motion, have to have an AV guy come in and, and look at it and look it up, you know, unless there's a police report. By the time you ask them to bring a police report, 75% of the people gave up, got a new phone, or just don't do it. They just don't follow up. There's a few, very few. And then the problem is when the police want to come in to do a report, they always wanted the person who was on duty. You can't get the police at the same time based on the store's schedule. So the same guy's not there. They're calling, interrupting the other shift that has, has no idea of what happened on the shift before with either the shoplifter or the, they're not the night shift. They want to come into the... The crime happens at night is a night shift, but they always want to come in on the day. Right. There's a, a whole different kind of staff that's doing different kind of things. The night shift is just there to watch and, and just watch and protect yourselves and, you know, text block by block if there's a problem and just emergency procedures. Is, that's sort of, a, sort of a really difficult kind of business to have. We don't have a patio that separates us. We, the security guard, thank God for Mickey's and my at Revolver, because they're really the partners that sandwich us, that allow us to operate at night, because they've always been there, you know, with the benefit. So, uh, you know, yeah. otherwise you couldn't stay alive anymore, our type of store. Yeah, thank you. And then I just had one more question for you. I know you talked about the difficulty and the financial impact of the AV footage and things like that. And I understand the shift in the store personnel. Um, if there were some support offered, if there, if you said, okay, this has been an ongoing problem for years, we've known it's a problem, we've tried to sort something out, if there were support for a business in um, financial compensation for that AV stuff, right? If you said, okay, yeah. we expect we get asked to do this by the sheriff, it's real asks, real specific asks from the sheriff. There's a report, it's listed. We need to take a look at this footage, and there's a, enough volume for it to make sense for yeah, you and yeah. the staff. Would that be something that would you support know, it, you? It's, or? A, it's always good. It's coordinated. A lot of this stuff, I wonder if it, in, in the future, if maybe even security footage held in the cloud can be shared with uh, with the officers through the cloud. You know, we're on the cloud with ADT, so they can get their own access. They can look at their own time. If there was a system implemented that didn't put the burden on the small business that had to follow up. A among the different staffs and among the different, it would really be all day. I think Adam can tell you how much time he spends on this problem a day. I, I think you'll be su really surprised to find out how much manpower it takes out of the business just to follow up on, on, on all this stuff. Yeah, I really appreciate it, thank you. Um, Commissioner Roman. Yeah, I just to see, do you think it would be official to have a couple of block by block people always stationed around that area on busy nights, as well as some uh, uniformed police officers walking around Santa Monica Boulevard, so there's always a presence. Do you think that would be helpful on Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays? Uh, despite what others might think, block by block is our best source for everything. I am on Texas with them every day. I'm close with all of them. They've been to my store. Some have been to my house. Uh, block by block is great to have them around. At least when that homeless guy is laying in front of the store and you just want to move him out mm -hmm. of the space and have somebody there overseeing him because the employee can't. And they also go a little bit mentally crazy. And it's really meant those you can't even you can't do anything about it. You let them go, they just come back and five minutes later, they throw over the racks, they come in the store, they throw over all the racks in the middle of the night. I don't know, my employees, I've had employees quit, they don't want to work there. One just moved to New Zealand. He moved here loving West Hollywood. This was his dream. He spent 11 months at the store and he decided to leave West Hollywood and said, this is not what it's cracked up to be, LA. I'm moving to New Zealand. And he left last week, Brian Tucker. Um, you know, it's hard to staff. It's not so easy, you know. All right, yeah. thank you, Mr. Block. Oh, did you have a question? Sorry, Commissioner. Well, I just wanted Oliver. to ask Mr. Block, um, would you, you mentioned sharing video footage on a cloud. Would you be willing to participate? Do you think that's a, a good oh, idea? I think that'd be good. If you're able to get access codes, working with some of the security companies, uh, I mean, I, the, the city has only really two main security companies, really, that I think most of the business work with. Um, I think that would be make it easier if they had access to the security footage. There was a way to bridge that. Um, maybe even there's a way in, I don't know, but like WeHo, you know, in, you know internet for everybody, you know, the WeHo, uh, Spectrum, maybe there's some way to have a 
security spectrum, you know. Seems like it would make sense. You mentioned the staff time on your end, but also the sheriff's time on the other end, yeah. going around and collecting that footage, that if yeah. it were readily available um, to the sheriffs, that it'd be uh, kind of a win-win for yeah, them when they're investigating a crime. Well, there is this repeated type of, you know, one person who's pickpocketed, doesn't know where it happened, and he, they're retracking all their steps. So they are, you know, going into multiple businesses and calling everybody in a state of panic at the same time the next day, you know. So, so for the consumer, the guest who says, I'm never coming back to West Hollywood again, which happens so often, you know what I mean? The person who, I came here last night, I got robbed, I just came in from out of town. This happens so often that we couldn't even, you can't even imagine what everybody else is thinking, you know what I mean, outside of our little bubble, you know, that they, it, it's, it's become a little bit tough to feel safe to come to West Hollywood, you know. So some with a way that we can look at restoring public confidence in this, it's not worth a half a million dollars worth of advertising, just, you know, refund, whatever. You know, I mean, it's not worth it at this particular point. I think if you looked and called businesses, what happened since August 1st in the stock market or whatever reason it is, no matter what reason it is, West Hollywood's economy is better because of inflation and higher prices, but lower traffic. You know, and I would think most people's businesses are a little bit down. You sort of, be worst summer August I ever had, or, you know, that I think my neighbors would probably say the same thing. I know we've been talking, I think a few people experienced the same type of uh, percentage declines over the last six or eight weeks. It's very unusual. It doesn't happen. We're usually like, this is a different beat, you know. Okay, um, before Mr. Block I'm referring to his seat, any other commissioner questions? All right, thank you. Thank you, Larry. Next, we have Adam Araman. Good evening, commissioners. It's an honor and privilege to be here today to speak with you guys. Um, a brief uh, introduction of me. Uh, I am a transplant to California from New York City. I have been living here for about 23 years now. And when I first moved to Los Angeles, I always wanted to live in West Hollywood. And when I first moved here, I was on the boundaries of West Hollywood. I was on Detroit and Fountain, but north of Fountain. So I, was, I wasn't really West Hollywood. So I busted my butt to work hard, save money, to live in West Hollywood. And I finally did that. And I'm a proud resident and employee of West Hollywood today. Pickpocketing is a big issue here currently. Uh, it's been all over the media. Um, people are being advised not to come to West Hollywood. West Hollywood is scary. You're going to get robbed. That's everywhere, unfortunately. But to talk about the pickpocketing that's happening currently, Mickey's, and I'm the operations manager of Mickey's. I'm so sorry. Um, Mickey's has taken several steps to mitigate the current crisis of the cell phone pickpocketers that's happening. We have spent thousands of dollars uh, since we reopened on July 1st of last year due to COVID. We have added several new 360 cameras, not your standard cameras, but the 360 cameras that you cannot pick your butt without being seen on camera. Um, we have added several of those cameras. We have been utilizing patron scan, which Todd has talked about. And I want to talk about what patron scan is. So if you come to Mickey's, you'll see a big old beautiful red podium, and there's a little camera and a scanner. When a customer comes in, we ask them for their IDs, we scan it. Passport, US ID, international passports, when you scan it, what it does, it gives you, it cross-references their passport photo and their last DMV photo or whatever ID they're giving. And it'll tell you their age, their year, and, and whatever public information is accessible. If a person has been 86 from another venue who uses patron scan and currently uh, Fiesta Cantina is the only 
establishment that uses patron scan. If there was a, a customer who was 86 from Fiesta Cantina for being in a fight, they would locate that person in the record, find them, and hit ban, and they could put a comment. If that customer came to Mickey's, we scan their ID, an alert will come up, and it will tell them they've been 86 from Fiesta Cantina, and then we will not allow them entry. But I just wanted to come and speak. I'm not a public speaker. I get anxiety when I speak. I failed it in college, but I feel like this is a very important topic to talk on, and we have done everything that we can to mitigate what's happening. And with, with patron scan, these people are changing. It's not the same people who are pickpocketing or doing these cell phone thefts. It changes. And we have photos sent to us from revolver security guards. We have pictures sent to us from other establishments that we, we, we have, and we show it to our security guards to be on alert. And I don't know what else we can do. Um, more security ambassadors, I don't think is the answer for this because the security ambassadors are limited on what they can do. Do we need sting operations? Maybe we need sting operations. And I believe there was a sting operation at Mickey's and the only reason I know that is because there was a, a fake phone turned in with uh, uh, the screen was painted with pink nail polish. And that was turned in and we're like, no one could have lost this phone. I'm like, you, you scrape it, it's like the paint comes off. So I feel like it was a, a decoy phone, but a decoy phone was turned in to us. <laughs> and we work very closely with the Sheriff's Department. We have a gr I have a great relationship with the Sheriff's Department. I have no complaints about them. I love them. We should not defund them. We need more of them. Um, but if a decoy phone was turned in, and if an undercover cop was pickpocketed, what's that to say? It's like they're so good. They're so good at what they do that, bam, it's like that. You get bumped, and then you're like, whoa, what the hell's my phone? You don't know where your phone is at. So we get several, it hasn't happened, it's, it's gone down in the last month or so, but on a regular Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I would say we would have anywhere from five to six people saying that, has anyone turned in a phone or anything like that? There's the 1% chance that we do have their phone. And it's always a pleasure handing them their phone. Um, but I think, Utilizing patron scan, if all the establishments, all the bars used it, they communicate with each other. Patron scan communicates with each other. So it's on a cloud base, and it could communicate with Mickey's, the Abbey, Revolver, Rocco's. It's very inexpensive. Um, the startup cost, I want to say, is maybe three, 4000 but the monthly subscription is $375. So maybe if the city could provide a grant to the businesses to assist in bringing in this equipment to help mitigate this. And when people see patron scan, it's already, they're like, whoa, what's going on? And they ask, why are you taking a photo? Well, it's for your safety and it's for our safety. And there's a signage in the front that says what it's doing. So I feel if all the establishments did it, and it communicated with each other. So if you were at the Abbey and you were 86 or something happened, bam, they flag it. And they come to Mickey's, we see it, we flag it. And then all the establishments will be like, okay, John Smith was 86 from Mickey's, the Abbey, Rocco's. We're not gonna let him in. So that's something that I would like to see the city do. Um, the city spends money on a lot of lovely things but spending the money on this public safety equipment, I think will be a plus. All right, um, Adam, before you return to your seat, um, we have a couple of commissioner questions. Of um, commissioner Roman. Yes. Hi, Adam. Hi. You are a great public speaker, by the way. Oh, um, I gotta see. <laughs> I gotta see. 
Uh, so I have so many questions about patron scan. It's like exactly <laughs> why I wanted to have this meeting, and that's like really incredible intel. So let me get this right. So if I'm a pickpocketer, I come to Mickey's, I give you my ID, I go in, I pickpocket, I get busted. You can now flag me. Mm -hmm. So now I get kicked out, I go around the corner, I go into the Abbey. Abbey has patron scan. I scan to go in. It's like a boop, boop, boop. don't let him in. And they say, get the fuck out, get the F out of here. And then I try to go to another bar that has it, and they just kind of just boot me out of everywhere. Correct. So that's our answer. <laughs> It's, it's pretty simple to do. I don't know it, why it, everybody's it, not doing that because... It communicates with each other. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It communicates. And, um, you know, we're all in this together in this room. We're all just trying to figure this out. I don't want to point fingers at anybody. I just want arrests to be made. I want this to stop. I've had numerous friends that have been pickpocketed. It sucks for all of us. It scares everybody from coming to WeHo. We want everybody to come here and party and have fun and dance and go home with their possessions. So that's what we're here for. But patron scan, I think, is a slam dunk. And I think that the city should absolutely step, step up and offer some kind of grant for everybody that wants to do it. And you guys should all start working together, perhaps create some kind of email chain between the GMs, the heads of security, with all of the 20 bars that are in town, and you can share information. We could do meetups between you guys, but Patron Scan is like so excited. So thank you for taking the time tonight and coming here and telling us that because that's huge. My pleasure. <clears throat> um, thank you. I'm Commissioner Oliver, and then followed by Commissioner Valbaum. We got out of order here. Um, Thank you, thank you for sharing. I did wanna follow up um, and see, have you seen a difference um, since implementing patron scan? Have you been able to rewind the tape with those 3D, uh, 360, excuse me, cameras um, and, and see the pickpocketing happen in action or is it that slick that you're not able to capture it with those cameras? It is so slick that you can't see it. Um, three of my bartenders were pickpocketed um, and this is when the end of their shift, and they just go, they're handing, hand, leaning against the bar, and then they just feel a bump, and they turn around, there's no one there, but their phone is gone. Mm -hmm. So it's so quick. I'm sure if we were to go back and search, we would find it. And I'm not gonna lie, for this one employee, we did go back and search, and we did find them, and we turned it into the sheriff's department. Um, so you can go back. But the thing is with these videos, for our videos specifically, it's about a seven to 10 day window that they're saved. Unless we know of an instance or an incident, then we can go and, and save it. But if we're not notified of anything, it's not gonna save, it's gonna record over itself. So we can go back and we can look at those 360s. But the thing is, the 360s at nighttime inside mm. the establishment is kind of harder to, to see. If you're on the patio where it's more light, it's more visible. But all of this is pretty much happening inside the bar and on the dance floor. And they're slick. Like, I'm not going to stereotype, but it's like they always have a, 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 like a, a fanny pack over their, their chest or... They're wearing a backpack in front of them. And it, those are the red flags that we look for, along with the images that we've printed out and we have in our, in our manager's office. So when security comes in, they can look at the, the wall of shame. And they look to see if there's anyone new and keep an eye out for those people. And um, you mentioned three to 4,000 startup for the, the uh, patron scan I want to say it was about 2750 like $3,000, I want to say. And they give you like an iPad. Like it's not an iPad, it's a, it's a Windows-based um, iPad. And they give you a scanner. And you just scan, put the passport down, and it says scan male, scan female. You just scan male or female, depending on how they identify. Um, and it scans it, and it gives you all the alerts. If it's expired, if they turn, t when they turn 21, if they're under 21, mm. their correct age, and a, a description of them. 
So it's worked for us before, and I love it. It is the best $375 a month you can spend, and the $3,000 startup is really nothing. Have you seen a deterrent effect? Yes, I do see a deterrent. Um, people don't want to have their pictures taken, and they're like, oh, we don't feel comfortable having our picture taken. So I'm like, well, we'll have a good day. And it is a deterrent, and a lot of customers feel more comfortable and safe coming into Mickey's, knowing that we are just adding that one ad of protection to them, that you're not gonna come inside. We know who you are, we have your name, we have everything like that, and we'll relay that to law enforcement as well if needed. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair Balbone. Thank you, I also think you've done your public speaking teacher well. Um, <laughs> thank you. So actually, Commissioner Oliver asked my question, but I'll phrase it a little bit differently. Um, what percentage of people do you think you're turning away? I mean, how common is it? What percentage? Are we Does it happen away? every I would night? Say is it maybe, one in ten? It happens every night. It happens. I would say maybe five percent. Okay. Okay. Of people. You know, and we were here Monday night talking about nighttime safety for you know establishments as well, and I would think that this would also help with that potentially. That is people it who does. It are, does. And you know, it does. predatory in different ways, right? It does. There's yes. pickpocketers, and then there are people who want to take advantage of people in other ways. Um, have you seen anything on that front when you see the flags come up? Is, is any of it related to people who may be assaulting other customers? We have had accusations of customers saying that they've been assaulted at Mickey's or their drinks have been spiked and we roll back the camera, it's a 360 camera, and the camera can follow you. And we've turned all this videos to the law enforcement, and you could completely follow them. If they left the bar, if they go into the bathroom, if they go inside the bathroom, obviously we have no video in there. Um, but it has helped us giving an alert to our customers to, hey, be on high alert. And we have signage when you walk in, uh, we have these brand new TVs, and on it says, beware of pickpocketers, keep your belongings to your side, put it to your front. But it has. I, I believe patron scan is a deterrent. It's a deterrent. If, 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 if I'm a criminal, and I'm going to go out, and I'm going to hey, I'm going to go rob someone today, and I see that they're utilizing a camera system and checks your ID, I'm going to choose not to go to that establishment because I don't want to get caught. But I feel it's a big deterrent and it helps. I believe it will help every establishment if we all work together and make West Hollywood safe again. Does it also help with fake IDs? Because I would think, you know, not that I'm a criminal, but I've watched lo <clears throat> lots of Law and Order. Um, if I were going to do pickpocketing, I wouldn't carry my own ID. I'd carry some type of fake ID. Right. But does this also capture fake ID and you just turn them away because it's not legit? It does, it does. It does tell you if it's a fake ID, but we don't just rely on patron scan. So patron scan is a tool that our security guards use. So it's just a tool. So when you get the ID, obviously you wanna feel it because you could tell a fake ID and then you're gonna put it scan it or place it down on the scanner and take a photo of it. Maybe it takes, I don't know, two seconds for it to scan and it'll pop up. So you have two sides of patron scan. The left side is the actual ID that you scan and the right side will be the DMV photo. So they're linked. Yeah. So patron scan is linked to the DMV system. So you, so you could catch, identify. You might exactly. catch some people with just fake IDs, right. underage drinking, correct. but you may capture other people using fake IDs for other reasons. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, Commissioner Oliver. Um, real quick, um, would you be willing or do you think it'd be helpful to participate in a voluntary program um, to share security footage with the Sheriff's Department directly so there isn't that added step of, of having to go to you, then pick, you know, find someone to look through it? Um, would that be helpful? Yeah, I have, I have a great relationship with the Sheriff's Department. Um, Detective Ferraro has my cell phone number, so he calls me whenever he needs something. Um, so yeah, like I have, we have no issues working with the Sheriff's Department. 
Um, our videos are not cloud-based, I don't think. It's, it's stored on the cloud, mm -hmm. but it's only stored for like X number of days because of the megabytes and all that. But I have no issue sharing video footage with law enforcement, um, and we have in the past, and we will continue to do so. That's it. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Adam before he returns to the Yeah, I had requested. Chair, thank you. Um, how recently were the three bartenders pickpocketed? I'm sorry. How, sorry, how recently were the three bartenders pickpocketed? Uh, four months ago, okay. approximately. Have you seen a difference um, or a decrease in just general activity at Mickey's? I know we heard a little bit about just like a dip in overall attendance. And we have. We have seen a, a, a slight decrease in business. You know, we were just barely recovering from COVID. And we were about at 95%. And then monkeypox hit the news. Yeah. And now business has gone down. So we've seen about a, a, a decrease in sales, about 30 to 40% um, due to monkeypox. And I believe, I know this has nothing to do with public safety, but this is because they're targeting monkeypox to be a gay problem. Yeah. And it's not just a gay problem. And you know, people watch the news and they hear it and it deters them. But is monkeypox is not a gay disease only. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I also um, just wanted to ask, what's the process if someone says my phone was stolen? What's the process there? So we have several uh, steps into place. So if a customer says their phone is stolen, we direct them straight to security at the front door because we direct everything to security. They'll keep a log. We also have a little sheet of paper we have them fill out so we can get their name, phone number, and we'll communicate with them. And we ask them to contact us the following day because when we close at two or four o'clock in the morning and the cleaning crew is cleaning, they'll turn in one or two phones. Um, and then if we have their phone, we'll give them a call and let them know we have their phone. Um, and in the event of one of the ring situations, you know, when they come in and they swarm, what's the process there? What happens when one of your, when one of your staff realizes that the swarm has happened, right? And we actually have a ring situation. Um, what's the process just there? That's a very good question. Like our, our security guards are very good at communicating with each other. So they would then bring in four guards, just like circle them, not corner them in, but so we have eyes on them on all corners of the bar, and then we'll just, they'll follow them, and then we'll be like, excuse me, can you please come to the front door? And then they're like, oh, sure. And they come to the front door, you talk to them and just kick them out. And then before you do that, before you do that, we ask them, hey, can I see your ID real quick? Because you want their ID in your possession. So you can go to patron scan and quickly find it. Mm -hmm. And then flag them, and then send them off their way. Okay. And is there, is there a point of engagement with the sheriff at that point, or what, what's the process to find out if they still have the phones on them at that time? At that moment, no, there's no sheriff involvement. Okay. Um, usually, if they say they've lost their phone, we always direct them to the sheriff's department. We encourage them to file a report so the sheriffs know, so the city knows, so we know how many cell phone thefts are happening and stuff like that, where mm -hmm. they're happening. Um, but we, we direct them to the sheriff's department so they can file a report so then we can deal with the sheriff's department one-on-one. -on -one. Because I believe, I don't know who spoke earlier, we will not share our video footage with a civilian, mm -hmm. but we will definitely share it with law enforcement. Okay, great. And then, thank you for that. Uh, and so this is all very super helpful, and I also agree with your public speaking, it's wonderful. Um, but the other question I wanted to ask you is just about the patron scan itself. Um, I know you said that the people change, the crews change, you know, so you, you may have some folks logged in or logged in the patron scan, but you'll get a new crew. You get a new crew of folks. So I don't know that it's necessarily deterring the next group if they're working in rings. Um, that's not a venue related thing, it's just about how the rings are right. operating. Right. So I just wanna know from you, what is, the, What's the most effective, or what's the um, best use you've had out of patron scan? Where do you feel like it's in any and all areas that it's really been the most kind of beneficial, and how it's shifted how you manage business, and then also maybe um, just some of the detriments. Anything that you're like, 
I wish it could do this, or it doesn't really work the best in this area, just so we can look at supplemental things. So patron scan is a great tool. It's not the solution, it's a tool. Um, what we have also done, we have stopped allowing backpacks or fanny packs coming in after 9 p.m. Uh, we allow it for happy hour because, you know, people go to the gym, they go to the store, they want to have a cocktail after their workout. So after 9 p.m., we have banned any backpacks or large, you know, fanny packs coming inside, um, inside Mickey's. And I believe that has helped somewhat as well. Um, and what was the step? I'm sorry. Oh, just any other like benefits for patron scan? Patron or? scan is amazing. I'm not going to stand here and say, oh, patron scan is horrible, this and this and that. <laughs> um, but patron scan will give you it's 100% if it's more than one venue using it. Because currently, like I said, it's just me. It's Mickey's and Fiesta. Okay. But that's just two bars in West Hollywood. There are several bars, Sunset, Santa Monica. If all of the bars implemented that, I think we should see, we would see, not should, we would see a change. Thank you. Um, and then I think uh, the other question I wanted to ask you is, and it sounds like this is really could be just more like an inter, you know, venue tool for preventative action, right? The best use or the best? Correct. Okay. Thank you for that. And then is, um, are you also noticing an 1130 or roughly time frame? We heard earlier that it seems like this is targeted around 1130 or when it's most busy. That's you, correct. Yeah. It happens around, say, from the midnight, 1130 to... 2.30, because, you know, Mickey's has after hours. Yeah. So the chaos happens when all the other bars let out. And I'm, I'm not going to sit here and stand here and say that there's no pickpocketing happening on the sidewalks, because these people know when and where to go. So they've, they've already studied us, they studied all of the establishment, they know all of our security guards, they know all the security guards at, at the other establishments, they know when to go, when not to go, what security guards know them, what security guards don't know them. So a lot of it I, I'm, I'm gonna say happens on the sidewalk as well, when it's so congested on the sidewalk, when all the bars let out and people are trying to come into after hours, a lot of the pickpocketing also happens on Santa Monica Boulevard. It's not just in the bars. It's also on the streets. How do we deter that? Maybe more foot patrol, more ambassadors, just a presence, just having more security presence on the streets. Yeah. Okay. Thank um, you. Adam, thank you. So how did I do? You actually did very well. <laughs> yes. Thank you, thank you. I'm looking forward to your Hamlet's advice to the players. Uh, Commission Secretary, our next speaker, please. Yeah, so we have one more speaker in chambers, and then we have another speaker that might be speaking in Zoom. So Catherine, if you are ready, please approach the podium. Good evening. Um, I was here on Monday to speak about cannabis and adding that to the conversation. I'm sorry, not to Can you pull the mic down? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, I was here on Monday. I asked council and many of you to make sure to include cannabis in the public safety conversation. I'm really thankful because uh, the council added it immediately. I also heard that, Danny, that they uh, almost all asked you about security. And I want to point out that the security guards that are working in these industries, or working for these businesses, really are just to protect the business. Their concern is gonna be inventory and, and the store itself. When I recommended that block by block be added to regular patrol, I want that to be for the community. Because what's happening is that these are largely cast businesses, if, if most people don't know. Because of federal regulation, it's largely still a cash business. And so what happens is that these patrons have cash, they go into the store, they have their, you know, their merchandise, and when they're leaving, people in the neighborhood know that, that 
customers have left and that they have this merchandise. So that makes them more ripe for theft and then because they're in the neighborhood, these are already in the neighborhood, I think that there's a concern from residents that what happens is that, oh, I'll just take that package that I see because they're already in the neighborhood. I think it's a really valid concern um, from the community. So I want to ask again that we station block by block regularly in the community to learn what like the vibe of it is and what the rhythms are because what will happen is that there will be public intoxication. And I want to point out that there is a hippie, holistic, Narcan version for cannabis that, that the, the police and block by block can utilize really easily. And I'm gonna tell this to the public. If you ever feel like you're too high, scientific studies have shown that drinking water, taking deep breaths, chewing on peppercorns, and smelling a lemon can all help sober you out. And those are super easy tools for block by block and for the sheriffs to utilize. All right, and then moving forward, I just wanna say, we need, as a community, to really support each other and to set each other up for success. Moving forward, we know there's gonna be changes in the community, and what I'm seeing is so much crazy rhetoric that I just really wanna remind people that we are a community, we need to support each other, and we only succeed if we're creating each success for each other and enabling, let's, let's wait, let's set each other up for success, yeah? Thank you. I have, Thank you. I have a question. So Catherine, the question that I have, um, I heard you speak on Monday about the cannabis lounges in particular and the concern that some of what we're seeing could happen there too, right? And I would assume pickpocketing, someone who's high is not moving very fast usually, right? Or they may not be aware. Exactly, they may not be aware. So my question would be, and you know, I know that you work with several different entities, if patron scan would also be a good option for them. They already have to ask for ID. So if I'm sorry, say again? The patron scan that's been discussed tonight, particularly for the lounges. lounges. You know, I mean, I think something that's interesting is generally like cannabis intoxication and alcohol inebriation are very different, right? And actually studies, I can cite a study that shows that you generally cannabis inebriated people know that they're too high. So that's a very distinct difference between that and alcohol. I mean, obviously these, these, these uh, uh, scans are, and anything for nightlife, it's all of it is just information and it's gonna help. And there's gonna be thieves all over the place. So yeah, we should definitely incorporate it. And actually something I wanted to ask Adam, if he's still here, but he's not, is he? Okay, because you know what I am curious about, and something else I think is important, is why can't bars share, share with the public? He said that the public can't access this footage, and I just think it's helpful to let them know why. Yeah, all right. Okay, any other commissioner questions before she returns to her seat? Yes, thank you. I want to just make sure I understand, and thank you for all your comments and input. Um, I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying about when folks are leaving, because if folks are leaving any business with merchandise, there's a chance for theft, but you said people are going to see that package and take that. Can you just walk I, me through? You know, so if you're in a dispensary, right, or you know that there's a dispensary there, there's two things. You know there's a higher likelihood that that, that patron has cash. And you also know that, you know, they went in and bought something that's stealable, that people are gonna, and, and not a lot of people go into dispensaries to looky-loo. It's, it's more of a situation where they're actually purchasing, right? And actually, Carrie, if I may say, that all of my work in the cannabis space has been in education and advocacy. I've produced uh, uh, workshops and conferences with ca uh, cannabis doctors. So I come from this from a health perspective, and I really, I really want to say this plant is a miracle. It can remediate soil. It can do so much, and I really come from that perspective. I just think there's a difference between the plant and the industry, and I just want to remind people of that. Yeah, thank you. And then would you be willing to do a like educational session with this city council, boards, and commission members to do some of that? Has you know, that happened? I'll tell you what, I appreciate that question very much. I don't feel I'm expert enough to do it, but I 100% know plenty of people that would love to come in and talk to you all. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, commission Secretary, um, are there any more in-chamber public comments? We have no more in-chamber comments. In Zoom, we do have a caller, number ending in 3143. If you do wish to speak, please press star six. 
to unmute yourself. Again, the caller that is on Zoom, if you do wish to speak, please press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, perhaps we move on. Yeah. Um Do we have any more um, callers in Zoom? Thank you for this discussion. I know that this is, a, this is an issue that's been going on in our city, and I have talked about it at City Council. About, about a year ago, there were 11 or 12 customers of a bar that came by the sheriff, sheriff of, uh, by my property and apparently somebody stole their phones, all 12 of them, but I'm not sure how that happened all at the same time. But the location on, on the Apple ID that they use, or Apple phone that they tracked their phone, it showed that it was somewhere around the property uh, between my property and my neighbors and, and uh, you know, we all were out there so 2.30 till 5 a.m. and had a crowd around on the property. So I tried to help, but nobody could locate them. I did hear on city council or one of maybe public safety that sometimes those phones were taken and then thrown into a trash can. Didn't really understand why they would do that, but, but anyhow, this is just that experience was, was a personal one, and I felt bad for the 12 people that had to spend, you know, all night Till morning, I was searching for their phone. I can't imagine. I would be in panic if I lost my phone. But but thank you for this uh, topic. And I've spoken about needs for cameras in our city, especially on the commercial uh, streets and, and also residential streets. This was a camera by my house at Cynthia Larrabee with several accidents and and, uh, and uh, people coming up from you know the the strip to wait for Uber and and Lyft and you know, a lot of fights and discussions and noise. So I think those cameras would help to at least show who came by up Larrabee and where did they go to drop the phones off. But anyhow, so just a personal experience that that sort of, uh, you know, saddened me that this is going on in our city and uh, felt bad for the uh, bar customers. So I appreciate for this attention that you're, uh, and the time that you're spending on this matter and hopefully uh, this evening come up with a solution, but I think the cameras are one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And we do have one more member of the public that wishes to speak. Paul, if you want to approach the podium. Hello, Commissioner Dom Paul Nichols with Hart and Rocco's. Um, first off, uh, I'd like to say that uh, I think that security and the Sheriff's Department is as equally concerned about this and has been doing a great job. Uh, we've had a lot of observations, a lot of stuff has been covered about what this is, who these people are, how they operate. Um, and the one thing we've noticed is obviously this is not a crime of convenience. This is not somebody stealing money to feed themselves. These are people who are part of a, basically a criminal organization. Um, they're professionals. You know, Hart has given us a bit of an interesting uh, view of it because we have a bird's eye view L like Adam was mentioning it's very hard to see them on camera because they know what they're doing they actually have a sense of where the cameras are I mean they, they know who I am I would walk around the club with my phone out like this like just begging for somebody to take my phone so I could catch these people but th they're they know who's who they know where security stands so one thing we did at heart was we had guards over the mezzanine kind of looking down like with some with binoculars to find them and, and they would follow the swarms, and they usually have like a decoy. It's usually parties of three, um, and they'll have usually a very scantily clad female or male dancer who will usually do something really crazy on the dance floor to distract people around them, and then the other two in the team go and grab their cell phones. So we started looking for that kind of behavior at heart, and we actually got like super high uh, green laser pointers 
because they also could tell when security was onto them, and the guard in the mezzanine would shine the green laser pointer and follow them around, and the other guards would come and grab them and catch them. So it's, it's like the level of sophistication you know, of this, it's, it's not a matter, and you know, Robert, we've had this conversation personally, we've shared data, it's not a matter, a matter of bad security, bad policing, not even bad education. I mean, we went to the point of saying, well, people don't like to listen to security, and people don't need read signs, so I had like an over-the-top drag queen at the door who was like, hey girl, watch your phone, watch your phone, like trying to make it fun, and it's not even that, it's, these guys are pros, they know what they're doing. A couple things that we noticed, uh, one, uh, you know, they make mistakes like anybody, uh, one thing we noticed was one phone was, was not turned off because they turned them off so people can't use Find My iPhone. And they found a massive bag of iPhones out in the suburbs and it was in like under a bush in a box that was obviously some sort of drop off point. So there is a level of organization here. And the other thing, the question we all ask, you know, if I stole Danny's cell phone, <laughs> it wouldn't be much good to me. You can't really do much with a phone. Uh, we also noticed a few patrons with their phones when they finally got turned on for a second literally were in like Shenzhen, like they ended up in China. So these phones are being stolen, they're being shipped, and they're being sent somewhere, they're being decoded and unlocked and probably sold internationally. Like this is not a small local operation, this is something with a serious level of sophistication. So I think we've talked about a lot of ways we can stop it, and they definitely thrive in chaos, so the harder we make their lives, the better. Uh, and we scan IDs, uh, we haven't done the, the patron scan because uh, Sometimes there is hesitancy with people. It's still, West Hollywood is a place for LGBTQ people to feel safe. I've lived here and worked here for 20 years. There are patrons who are nervous for whatever reason about getting their picture taken, which is understandable. So, and the same thing with the bags. We've done all that, ban the bags, ban the fanny packs. Done. But then there's also a point where you're like, how much are we gonna penalize the good guys for the behavior of the bad guys? And I think that's the thing, is not just going after these people, because they do come back, and the sheriff's department does arrest them. What happens after that? I, I know Danny wanted to look into that as well, but even more so, there's a snake here that needs to be cut off at the head, and I think there's a serious organization behind it, and they're targeting West Hollywood. We can even see how they profile customers. You know, we can, I, I can look at somebody coming into the club and be like, they're gonna take her phone. I'll go up to them myself, be like, Hun, watch your phone, it's in your back pocket again. I'll go up to people and tell them 10 times. They know how to target these people and they're, they're sophisticated and they are, they're, the local people that get arrested, they're just a small piece of what's really going on here. Any questions for me? Um, um, yeah, and also commissioners, please use the notification um, system if you have a question. That way I know that you, you know, wanna be in queue. Okay, um, go ahead, um, Commissioner Steele. Yeah, thanks, and I did it the last two times. I don't know why it wasn't popping up, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but thank you, just thank you for all the information. I think just to respond to what I've heard a couple times, this is certainly not about our nightlife not doing, doing the right thing or, or the security teams. I know they're working super hard all the time, yeah. um, but I think it's exactly this, right? We know there's a bigger, deeper dive issue here, and at some point we had to get in a room and say, let's seriously look at all of this. Let's figure this out and do something that's a, big, a bit bigger picture because the answer of there's a month to month dip and then it comes back and we're seeing six, over well, close to 69% increase year over year. It's a problem that's existed for a very long time. Yep. And also folks turning on that phone and getting a notification that it's in Tijuana or China is exactly the feedback that I've gotten from community as well. So um, I appreciate all of that, uh, that feedback, so thank you. And I think also we won't, there'll always be crime. I, just, I think we all wanna make it just so hard to do in West Hollywood that they give up on this city, which is what we'd all like to see. And you know, we, it drives us crazy. There's nothing worse than at the end of a night, a good night, of you know, six people that are crying because they lost their new iPhone. It just, it, it drives us all insane. Um, and it's just, it's, it's, it's and, or going on Yelp and reading that 40% of your reviews are about a stolen phone. It's just a bad look. Um, and, I, and again, I don't think these are petty criminals. This is somebody that says, oh wow, we got something good going on here. And they also target, you know, they seem to target predominantly females in our experience, and I think a part of that is because females and straight females, uh, or whatever they identify with, feel comfortable in our city, which is a beautiful part of this city, but also it's a shame, and I know you had a meeting about other issues too, that then that leads to predators kind of taking advantage of, of somebody feeling comfortable being in an environment, you know?
Um, I have a quick question. Um, and this can be for anyone that works at an establishment, management of security. Are iPhones the preferred yes. phone for pickpockets? Yes, for sure, 100%. Okay. And the weird thing is, there'll be something else that's equally accessible, like a wallet. You, every now and then you'll get a pickpocket who, again, will take a wallet, but these people are specifically going for phones and iPhones. They're not, it's not, it's, it's the iPhones. That's what they're there for. So somebody's giving them the instruction. Again, it's not somebody trying to steal stuff to get a fix on drugs. It's, they're, they're working for somebody who said, go get as many iPhones as you can, leave them in this spot. I mean, they know what, there's a real <laughs> level of sophistication here, and they know what they're doing, and they know what they want. And again, they know the times to do it. They know all these things that are gonna happen, and they plan it. We, it got to the point where we would be ready for it, and we'd have people standing, because we could predict kind of when it would start to happen, and they're, they're good. You know, and luckily, Hart, again, we just had a unique opportunity because there's not many venues in West Hollywood that have a second floor where you can look down on the main dance floor. So we were able to see what a security camera, you know, won't necessarily pick up because they know where those cameras are. They know exactly where every camera is. They know where security stands. So we would have kind of decoy securities. It's kind of standing like there were patrons. Sometimes I'd even give them like a pretend cocktail, <laughs> like a patron looking over the club and they would catch them. Um, Vice Chair Balba. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things that I know you said helps, but it doesn't stop it, is advice, prevention, and things of that sort. It sounds like you, and I'm sure, I didn't think to ask this of anyone else, but if we were to start to circulate information, yeah. what kinds of tips and pointers would you help us put together? And you don't have to answer it in exhaustive detail tonight, yeah, but yeah. I think that's one of the things that you all have become eyes, ears, and experts. Yeah. If you know what it looks like, you know, I, I had a friend who had her st phone stolen and she, yeah, showed, yeah. she showed me the purse she had. I was like, yeah, that's like ripe for picking. You need something with zippers and inner pockets that it's hard to get things out of. Yeah. But what would you tell people? We, we started actually a campaign because we were so frustrated and people weren't reading signs. So we, we, we had a campaign of uh, like superheroes, cartoon characters. And it would say stuff like, hey girl, watch your purse. Hey, hey sis, watch your shit. And it would just be funny to try and get people to engage with it. And we'd list the pointers on the things you can do to prevent pickpocketing. Don't use your back pocket, use zippers, don't leave your purse open, keep your stuff zipped up, look out for your friends. If you have a group that's being overly, you know, engaging with you, maybe kind of question why, if especially it's somebody you've never met before. So we do have a list of things, and it did help to a certain extent. But again, these people are really good. You know, the, again, it's not, by being careless necessarily that people are having their, their cell phones you know, stolen. It certainly makes them the easiest people to steal from. And any organized crime will obviously go towards what's easiest. But you can also be really you know, on it. Again, like Adam was saying, bartenders who are very well aware of this problem had had their cell phones stolen. So I think education is part of it, but this is a much deeper and bigger problem than that. And again, it's not even, you know, it's not a sheriff's thing or necessarily it's a, it's a next level kind of operation that's going on now. Um, Commissioner Oliver. Thank you for, for sharing. Um, it's really, it, what I'm hearing overall is this is a much bigger issue oh, yeah. than just the individual bars and even just our city. Um, but I just wanna say thanks for taking the measures. It's clear that you're prioritizing uh, yeah. patron safety um, when it comes to pickpocketing. Um, but, and I'll save the rest of what I want to talk about for the uh, commissioner comments, but I just want to say thanks for, for sharing yeah, that tonight. Yeah, it sucks, because it's something that, you know, we can fix a soggy pizza, <laughs> like the chicken wings aren't hot enough, but that's something that's so hard to fix, and we just, we all want to fix it. The Sheriff's Department wants to fix it. I mean, me and Robert have had this conversation many times outside the Abbey. Every time I go, I'm like, how's it going with the pickpockets? Is it getting worse? And we share our notes, and he's on a text group with, with us, and yeah, we want to fix the problem, and thank you all for having this meeting and understanding how important it is and how bad it's gotten. Um, Commissioner Roman. Yeah, I just want to thank you again for coming in. I know you just flew in and came straight here, so we appreciate it. Um, and it's super interesting to know that there's like a potential drop house somewhere and these phones are getting shipped back to China where, they're, where they were originally made. So this is a huge operation. And which is why, you know, I had the idea of like involving the FBI in something like this because I don't think our West Hollywood Police Department is going to be able to, you know, bust that big crime ring. I mean, we could deal with the local stuff here, but 
um, contacting the FBI and seeing if they can get involved in something like this because it can be like a, we can have like a three-pronged approach towards this. So um, that intel is very valuable. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And then I just had a final quick uh, two questions. Um, number one, is it a specific time of night? Are you also seeing that 1130 to 130? Yep. Yeah. 1130 to 130. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And then has there, uh, how have the last two months been in particular Art and Rocco's? You know, there has been a decrease, but there also has been a decrease in business. And I think that they target those, they target Don't the me. chaos, you know, e even the thing, you know, <laughs> and like to defend Mickey's on this, that w when we were, you know, doing a heart and we were inquiring about possibly staying open past 2 a.m. and they're like, oh no, no, we have too many problems at Mickey's. It's not Mickey's not policing, you know, what's happening at their venue. It's the fact that at 2 a.m. you have thousands and thousands of people leaving these venues at the exact same time. And I'm sure you've all seen what Uber surging is. Guess what it does at 2 a.m. on a Saturday? These people don't have $120 to take an Uber home. So they're kind of just lingering waiting for the Uber prices to go down. And they have nowhere to, to go, you know, except Mickey's, which can only take so many people in. So essentially, you have what they call the street fair. I mean, it looks, if anybody wanted to join me at 2 a.m., it looks like Mad Max out there. You know, it's like, it's, it's crazy. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. I mean, it's a whole other topic, but. Even in certain countries like Canada, bars are required by law to stay open for an hour after they stir stop serving liquor to create a flow of patrons exiting the establishments. You know, and that's been a long thing for a long time that people talk about the street show or the street fair, the st you know, that happens in West Hollywood when every venue closes at the exact same time. It is creating a certain degree of chaos and criminals thrive in chaos. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, thank you. Do we have any more speakers waiting? We don't have any more speakers. Okay, great, thank you. Um, commission, we're not gonna do commissioner comments tonight. We're gonna wait until um, a meeting when we can put this on the agenda and speak on it. Um, so I wanna thank everyone for coming in and taking the time. I know a lot of you should probably be at your establishments right now working. Um, and we greatly appreciate it. You know, we've had a lot of great dialogue and commissioners have asked some great questions, you know, throughout the evening. So um, we're gonna forego any additional comments at this time. And before we adjourn, um, Director Revis, I believe, um, would like to make a statement. I'm sorry, why are we foregoing the commissioner? I have a lot of questions. We didn't get to engage yet. We have a show. hard out at, um, seven, at 8 p.m. Oh, that's, so, that's not the time frame that, that is publicly posted. So, okay, that's not what's online. Um, just so we're, I know we've talked about that before, <laughs> but that's not the time that's online. So that's the first thing. Um, but so are we able to share some action questions for the sheriff too before we get out of here since we have 20 minutes? Um, I will allow it, but can we keep it brief so we can make our heart out? Sure. Um, okay, great. So I think the questions that I have specifically are in relation to the, the numbers. I know we've asked for a more in-depth report. I think this, this is a pretty thin report, um, but the questions that I have that we can follow up with um, are specifically the numbers that we have are reported numbers, right? So this is not an estimate in regard to what we think is happening overall. These are just the numbers we're seeing in terms of the numbers that were given here. Is that correct? Yes, that was, that's correct. These are the reported numbers. Okay, thank you. Um, and then so it looks like we had a, a, a jump down in August, um, which isn't over, but we're getting close. So that's a beautiful thing, but it also sounds like it's reflective of the amount of traffic in the city. Um, but my question is, we've heard a little bit about this going on for such a long time, um, year over year, and I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed that Captain Mulder isn't here and we weren't notified in advance. Um, this is a really meaty conversation. It's the reason we all wanted to be here. So um, I'll speak with Captain Mulder, but I'm, I just wanted to voice that clearly. Um, and the reason is there's a couple numbers that I think are, you know, we should talk about specifically, right? So first, the jump in 2016 to 2017 is 7.2%. 
the jump from 2017 uh, to 2018 is 68.22%, right? That's a massive jump in this issue. So my question is, and I'm positive you're going to have to go back and get information. I understand that. My question is, going all the way back to 2018, and we're looking at a 68.22% increase in this situation, that would lend itself to say something else is going on here. This is a much different number than we've seen in the city of West Hollywood. Can we get a little bit of understanding of what the dialogue is during that time? What happens when we see a jump in crime in any area, but in this area specifically, we know at that time there's something else happening, there's things we need to look at. Um, and then also um, for the reports, for the 237 arrests in July, and I don't have the report yet, so I know it's, it's forthcoming, um, those aren't cell phone arrests, those are not related to cell phone thefts, that's just the 237 total arrest number for the city? Correct. That's okay, so that's not related to this. Okay, got it, just want to clarity on that. Um, and then, I think some of the other stuff is bigger picture structural stuff that we can talk about, including, I guess, the one question I will ask is, have we had any engagement with the FBI? Have we reached out to larger organizations or even outside of West Hollywood um, agencies? We heard about things being dropped in the Valley and other places, not quite when they get to China, but still here. How, has there been dialogue and working with those other agencies? Can we find out? Uh, I can tell you I do not know about FBI. Uh, not being in the Detective Bureau, but um, I can tell you that we have worked with other agencies, LAPD, and uh, departments within our agency to work on these okay, items. Great. I'll save the rest of my questions. Thank you, Chair, I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Oliver. Um, thank you. I guess I just wanted to I'll quickly uh, express my concern, just extrapolating out from the current numbers. Um, in August, if we're at 450 pickpocketing incidents, um, by the end of this year, it'll be about double um, the highest uh, for any of the previous years. Um, it's clear that this is organized. We've heard the same things over and over and over again, and it's been a few years since I've done the, the FBI Citizens Academy, but if I recall, that is the FBI um, that would investigate organized crime, and I think that it's time for us to ensure that we're working. If, we, if we're not, uh, we need to be working with the FBI uh, to investigate this. Um, I also want to see if we can formalize the relationship uh, between the Sheriff's Department and businesses in a way that I would imagine, and I, and I don't have the numbers to back it up, but I imagine there's a lot of um, deputy and, and detective time spent chasing down footage. Um, and so if there's a way to streamline that so that crimes can be investigated in a more efficient way, I think that would be helpful. Um, and then ultimately, I would support if we can, I, I think we as a commission perhaps, I don't think we can tonight, um, but we might get this on the agenda um, to, to voice support for some measure that would help businesses add technological fixes like the patron scan, though I do have my concerns about the um, the picture part of it, but scanning an ID and just recording that I think is helpful because um, this is not just a threat to the individuals who, who patronize um, our establishments. It, if this becomes the norm and we continue to see this trend, this is a threat to our economy here in the city of West Hollywood. So um, we need to step up what we're doing and, and, um, and so I definitely want to see additional resources um, to fight this. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Roman. Yeah. I too just want to say I'm extremely disappointed that Mulder is not here. Um, I'm here. I took the time out of my life to be here and uh, because I'm concerned and we're doing this to help you guys figure out a way out of this. And just to be clear, are you saying that July there was 230 plus arrests in the city of West Hollywood? Yes, 237 arrests, that's our number. Because for that. I, I get the weekly reports and it's nowhere even close to that. It's more like 20 arrests in the month of July. So I'll go back through because the reports that I get from you guys, I calculate them every week. I send an email to David Wilson and Rivas and everybody and there's nowhere even like, 
I would say less than 20 arrests for the month of July. So I just want to be clear that you're saying there's over 230 arrests in the city of West Hollywood in the month of July. Um, I'll double check that, but that's not what I show in the data that you guys send to us. So um, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair Balbone. So I'll leave a breadcrumb trail on that. It might be part one versus all. And I know that when we have part one crimes, those are usually the ones that have arrests, but that's something that we may want to look at. Are you arresting people who are committing crimes outside of part one that are included in the total? Um, so that's just something for you to look at. One of the things that you know has been brought up is talking to the FBI. I think at this point someone should be speaking with Apple as well because I mean, one of the things we're all sold when we buy an iPhone is that our identity is protected, but our information is protected, and not if it's easy to steal, mm -hmm. and not if people are able to take that phone, ship it to China. I mean, that's a problem, and I think that that's a problem that we should also be working with the manufacturer. If there's a reason that iPhones are being shipped and other phones aren't, let's get after it that way too, particularly if we're reaching out to the FBI. I mean, I don't, I don't really know anybody at Apple, but... I think if we start to go up the food chain, that's something to consider as well, because we're not the only city it's happening to. And before um, I turn it over to Director Rivas to make comments, um, to all commissioners, um, the intent was not to prevent um, commission comments tonight. Um, we were just wanting to move it forward to another meeting where we could discuss it and agendize it. Um, Commissioner, or Director Rivas, I apologize. Um, you wanted to make a statement. I did, and, and thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Public Safety Commissioners, and, and again, for everybody that, that came and took time out of their day. I, I wanted to just take a brief moment to note in closing tonight that the city is uh, developing a community safety and well-being strategy, um, and as uh, September, um, you know, this strategic planning process will enter um, into its engagement phase um, and outreach. And so what that will do is, you know, the city will be looking to uh, acquire input from the residents, the businesses, community organizations, and other key civic groups. Um, there, there will be forthcoming information from the city about this, um, but in the meantime, if community members, uh, businesses, et cetera, um, have any questions, want to learn more, they can definitely reach out uh, via email to us uh, at www.weho.org forward slash CS. WB, and I'm just going to repeat that one last time, www.weho.org forward slash CSWB. Um, and as the chair mentioned, um, you know, we can certainly uh, discuss kind of the debriefing of this at our next uh, regular uh, public safety commission meeting um, and then agendize it, right, and include in the actions and the recommendations um, you know, any sort of direction that comes from the public safety commissioners. I know we have two commissioners that couldn't make it uh, this evening, and so I think it would be good, too, to kind of give them an opportunity to kind of weigh in and have an opportunity to kind of um, look back at this video as well, right, uh, in the recording. So that's all. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Director Rivas. Um, once again, thank you to everyone who took the time to come and speak with us tonight, and even those that came to witness this very special session. Um, our next scheduled public safety meeting is Monday, June 12th, or Monday, September 12th. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes, I'm going back in time. See, I need to get out of here. Uh, so Monday, September 12th at 6 p.m. here in Chambers. Thank you, everyone. We are adjourned. You know, you get to see your friends, maybe make a few new ones. You get to clean out your closet and hopefully make a few bucks in the process. You can use that money to buy new stuff, which you'll eventually get bored of. And then you can sell it and junk in the trunk. It's kind of like the cycle of junk. Yeah. For more information on junk in the trunk, visit weho.org.